Hi, it's Kim Edwards here. I'm going to be looking at modeling a 50s radio. So I'm just bringing in the reference, creating a free image plane. And now I'm just going to have a look at my preferences because I'm going to be doing some nerves curves. And in display nerves, I'm going to like to have edit points turned on by default and CV so that when I make nerves, they're always displayed. So we're going to make one of the buttons first, the lower button. And just going into my layout view and splitting it, clicking on the outliner layout shortcut and changing that to the top view. And now with the interactive creation on, I'm going to create some nerve circles and just going to use them to create the button. And to my left, I can see my top view. And as you can see, I can by default be creating a view with CVs and edit points displayed. So I'm just going to use X when I'm moving things around just so that they snap to the grid. Just arrange these in space and then we'll go over to surfaces and loft them and change the interpolation to linear. So just adjusting this quickly. So here in the loft operation, just changing the degree to linear. Do a little bit more adjustment. In fact, it looks like I need another one, so I'll just click through again. And it's auto-dependent when you do your lofts. Change it to linear again. There we go. We've got our basic button shape. A little bit more adjusting. And then we'll go to modify, convert nerves to polygons. So it's one of those things we're going to do with the different buttons first, and there's lots of different ways that we could approach this. This is a, a nerves way of doing it, because it's got a little bit more detail in this particular button. And then for the larger button, we'll, we'll start from polygons and compare that. Converting nerves to polygons now, just going to show polygons only over in the panel editor. And we'll just change it to quads and per span number of isoprams. So this seems a little bit heavy handed to begin with, but I know I'm going to have lots of little extrudes. I've just gone to normals and just set the normals again on that, just so it crisps up some of the edges. And over into the modeling toolkit, pressing uh, Control just to with the multi cut tool just to shoot some loops through just to contain the extrusion. And I've just changed my selector in the modeling toolkit from marquee click to drag. Well, I've gone back to pick first of all. I'm just going to pick little groove sections and then I'll jump back for easy selection to drag and just drag out those. I've just jumped ahead so you don't have to watch that. And then over in Modeling Toolkit, we'll extrude, reset the settings, and then just drag left on Local Z. And that's done. Alright, so I'll just go in and turn everything back on just in the show view, just to have another look. I'll extrude this little ring part here and then bevel it. So I'm jumping across to the edge view and I'll just bevel that. And just focusing on the polygons again. And I'm just going to merge those components to center. So now it's just a question of making a copy of this. So I'm just getting rid of all the other faces and then I'll just press Control D and then rotate with discrete rotate on, which is J toggles it on and Shift D to, to make some further copies. If you wanted to do instances, you'd press Control Shift D. In this case, we don't want instances. And just combining those objects, mesh combine and then merge components. And then I'm just going to go and use the bridge tool, delete that internal face there, just to clean up little gaps in each segment that I left behind. 
So even though this is going to be a fairly simple kind of clock, um, what's going to sell it and sells it with most models is not you know, too much detail for detail's sake, but if there are items that have detail in them, then you should go ahead and, and make them. Let's calculate my normals again. Edge. So we're not going to do any smoothing on this. This is going to be what it looks like. Give it a rename, and then that button is done. So now we're going to make the larger button, and this time go from polygon to cylinder. So it's a good idea to try and keep into you know values of 0 0.5, 0 0.75, 1.25. It just makes your life a little bit easier when you're moving things around. Just pressing Control right click to convert selection to faces to delete the back there. And I just went to mesh chamfer vertex just to chamfer out that center vertex so we get one big face there. You can now just pull things around and adjust. And then over in the modeling toolkit, just extrude with offset just to get an extra little rim edge there for that white part. Just using multi cut there and shift to do little snaps and beverly. And now I'll just put in the main parts of the buttons. And so this is going to be subdivided, so that's why we're going lower with the cylinder initially. And you can see in the actual button there, it's got a kind of a spherical dip. And I won't be able to do that perfectly to get nice reflections there just on this flat face, so I'll end up deleting it. So here, there's a little trick. If you go to your tool settings, you can set your manipulator to be on an edge, and then you choose the edge, which is what I'm doing here, so I can just pull those faces in really neatly. And just just extrude that and offset it a little bit more before we blow it away. Putting extra loops there because we are going to smooth it and I want that to be fairly crisp. Delete that face and then we're going to use a sphere to kind of cut it in half and reverse the normals to get that nice perfect sort of dip curve that we can see in the button. Just going to reset my move tool back to world space. Just using V to snap to verts. Deleting half. Snap it again. Just dragging on one arrow to snap it, scale it in, and then I'll reverse the normals. Scaling. So I would struggle to get a nice clean dipped face like that, just pulling polygons around. So I'm just going to delete that edge, I'm not completely happy with it. Just merging, combine the objects and the merge components. And just Grab the two loops and converted selection by clicking Control. Right click to convert selection to vertices and then went merge components. And now I'm just using the slide edge tool, which is under mesh tools, just to even up the dip there. And you'll see that we've got a nice, nice, perfect little dip here. So I just kind of professional courtesy, I'm just going to make the loops fairly even on this. Press 3 to have a look at what the preview will look like. And I think we'll need some extra ones, so I'm just doing multi-cut just around the base of those, and then I'll also do a multi-cut. <coughs> uh, just going to extrude the tops, just jumped across to drag again, just to help contain them a bit. Just a little bit up, just getting extra loops in there, just to crispen things up. And then I think I'll just throw in some more loops going across the buttons. Beveling, just to keep some edges crisp. Crease tool, mesh tools, crease tool just to crisp them. These ones up even more. 
looking pretty good. Alright, so I'm going to just press shift and do a center edge first on these and then side ones. Just want it to stay a little bit more boxy when it subdivides and this isn't going to interrupt the overall shape too much. So now if we have a look around here I've just just giving you a kind of breakdown of the different pieces that I made for the body really based on boxes, really simple box there. And the only bit that looks a little bit complicated is this section here. So you can make your own box yourself and frame. I don't need to show you how to do that. And just starting from a plane here, I'm going to use the insert edge loop tool to throw down the four grid that we need for that section and then I'm going to grab those edges and use the bevel function to make the little columns so just your manual bevel and go into the attribute editor which is control A incidentally and just set that to say point 0.2.1 do that on the horizontal ones as well so edit mesh bevel It's going to give us little grids. And now I use the multi cut with shift just to carefully put the uh, top sections in. And now I'll just grab the faces and use extrude, pull them in, and then I'll just use the move tool to pull them up vertically. So I'm just trying to keep this as simple as possible. And with that done, we can uh, select our little columns we made before and extrude them. Just reset the settings there. Drag them out. And just do a little bit more tweaking of those top sections now, just using edges to move things around. Just using isolate select because I'm having trouble selecting things. So you can use isolate select, you can use the show panel in your view to help isolate things. Just pulling those out. Nice little gate sections. Kind of reminds me a little bit of a dam. Flat gates, these things. Alright, that looks pretty good. A little bit more angle on them. Beautiful. So that's really low. Probably doesn't need to be high. And that section is now done. So now I'm just making a duplicate control D and then deleting the remaining faces apart from the front so that we can start to do those slatted panels at the front. So again I'm going to use the um, just going to use the extrude tool here just to create a frame. And you can see that it's actually ended up with two faces sitting on top of each other. So as long as I'm aware of that, I can quickly delete the face that I don't want. So that's something that you might want to keep your eye on. So now I'm getting the duplicate faces that we don't need. And that leaves me with the frame. extrude that and then I'll separate these two again. So I just did that by duplicating and deleting faces. So now I've got a frame section and I've just got those little panels there. Excellent. Now I'm going to use insert edge loop tool to throw in 15 loops 
I have to go into the poly split ring there and type in 15 because it maxes out on 10 in the tool. Grab those internal births, bevel them again. Just so we can make little separations between them. And then let's go in and grab some of those faces. And we'll extrude them. And I've just used the regular extrude because I just want to pull it in world space. So you can click on the little power button to shift between local and world space in your extrude manipulator in the viewport. And I'll just save this out. So the other thing to note in here, I'm just referencing in those two buttons. So referencing is basically going to load the two Maya files we've made the other two buttons in. Um, and so if I do change those files by opening them and manipulate them, manipulating them, it'll update them in this scene. So it's quite handy to use referencing keep your scene size down and just for project organisation. So I'm just throwing these in because we're going to have to make little cutaways in our front frame. So I'm just adjusting them and scaling them. Now to get the really nice neat sort of cutaway for these buttons, uh, this is not going to be a really great way of, of, of sort of doing it. We can use multi-cut and so forth, but that's not going to be a great way of doing it. So bearing in mind that bullions can be quite messy and destructive. Um, and then I've got saves of this should I need to. I'm going to make some cylinders in the spot that we need and use bullions to, to make the kind of inset cuts and this kind of injection molded front face that we need. So I'm just making this some cylinders now and I'm going to adjust them penetrate through our front face. Just doing some quick aligning here. So these cylinders are going to make the chop set for these buttons to sit in. So I'm deleting the history and then I'm going to combine them together, mesh combined, and then I'm grabbing the object that I want to have be cut into and then the cylinders are going to boolean difference. And that fuses these two things together. It gives me that nice inset cut. It's messy, it's not something I can now smooth. And I've got end gons. But for our purposes, there's going to be no real neat way to do it. And should I need to do it in a different way, I can always go back because I've got to save. So now I'm just going to lay out the buttons a little bit more in these inserts. snap everything back together from this exploded view. Just holding X. Great, so that's our two buttons. Now there's another knob underneath the clock that you can make in a similar way. Now here I want to make the clock face and I find sometimes it's faster to make uh, shapes in Illustrator and save them out as Illustrator 3 files and just import them into Maya. So in Illustrator you can just create a rounded rectangle really easily. If you save that out in a legacy format like Illustrator 3, there's something you can import just as if you're importing an FBX or what have you. So I'm going to make this based off these curves that I've brought in. Just do a loft that we've done before from these curves. And just need to reverse surface direction and edit nerves, reverse surface direction, change it to linear. And then I'm just going to convert this to polygons in a minute. Excellent. And that's our polygon. And now I 
we're just going to grab these corners and merge those words together in edit mesh merge components. We'll just do that on each section. And now I can just use snap to the so V and move tool just to snap them to the edges of the frame. So for me it's a lot easier sometimes to make some non-standard kind of curves in Illustrator and just import them in. So I'm just going to use the bridge tool now just to bridge the gaps. And so this is for the kind of plasticky section of the clock. And I'm going to use multi-cut to make sure I've got enough points to be bridging this together. Just holding control to do loops and shift to snap where I need to. And just clicking bridge, selecting edges, pressing Q to exit bridge, selecting edges again, and then pressing G to repeat last action to just bridge again. And that's all fused together now. Merge the verts, merge components, delete the history. I press 3 to see a smooth mesh preview. And now I want to separate the plastic part from the rest. I'm just grabbing that, the right edge I need for that. Try to use angle selection for this. some adjusting, some scaling. Cool. Alright, so now go ahead and grab that edge. Do some creasing. And then I'm just going to go to some more loops in to get that crisp. So I'm just selecting a face, pressing shift full spot to expand. Here I've just pressed B which is soft selection and B in middle mouse toggling gives you an expanding soft selection brush. Just to hold those edges in the corners. And just hiding the bits like the leftover parts. And that's looking pretty good for a clock face. Okay, I'm grabbing that edge, going to I should go to detach components actually, just to make that a separate mesh. And instead I'm going to just, struggling mentally here I think, I think I'm going to use the extract tool, so I just grab those phases, shift will start to expand and then I'm just going to go mesh extract. So this is going to be the plastic section of the clock. And just do some renaming, delete history. It's plastic and this is the flat part of the clock. So now I'm just going to create a Another polygon plot.
line that's going to be the face of the clock. Behind the plastic, which is going to be transparent, obviously. font folder, LT or Carta, which roughly matches the font in the reference images. And I'm making them in here, and then I'm going to go to type create outlines, because um, I will find this more amenable than using the type text tool straight inside of, straight inside of Maya. So I've just gone to create Adobe Illustrator option, uh, object and I've left it to bevel. I made it straight out in the settings. And so that's made me a, a polygon object with extrude and optionally beveling. And I can now just place in my scene. So that's over and create Adobe Illustrator object. And I've just had bullet bevel and polygons as the output type. And now back into Illustrator, I'm just going to show you how you can use primitive shapes. So this is just a 100mm by 100mm scene, just using Alt to drag these, going to the little uh, Convert Anchor Point tool there to change those types, and the Direct Selection tool to move points around, and we'll just throw down a cylinder. And I'm just using a line to artboard center to align them. Just using shift and arrow key to move move things evenly. Holding shift there to snap. And I'll dragging that second circle up. And I'll just delete that one that we don't need there. Now if I open up window and open up my pathfinder. I am with all those objects selected, I can just click on the first little button which will merge them together into one uh, shape. And now, with those two selected, I'm going to click on the second little button which is going to do a little difference and that gives me the, a nice easy way of making the curves, saving out as Illustrator 3. Okay, so this is the finished model, so there's no parts here that we haven't covered how you would make. I'll just do a little quick breakdown. So I've added some extra clock numbers. We already made the plastic face and behind that's the other Illustrator object created hands. There's a little screw there. There's another knob and so forth. There's some little feet. There's some quick ones. And so you can see it's all come together fairly nicely. So what we want to do now is, just for a work in progress kind of render, is we're just going to assign a slightly transparent material to that plastic, just so we can see the objects beneath. And we're going to use a Mentoray material, which is Mental Images Layered Material, which is a new material that I've been working on, NVIDIA and, and uh, Mentoray. 2015 of Maya, and you can see the base materials have got some presets there. I'm just changing it to transmissive distance, so in other words, a glass like material. And I'm just going to pump some distances in. So, the these new Miller materials are, are less expensive and more versatile than the the architectural and design materials, the MIA materials. 
If Mentorai has a loader, you can just go into your plugin manager and look at the loader there. Mentorai should ship by default with your version of Maya. And you can see on just in the render settings here, I've turned on enable color management. What that means is I'm going to do that also in the viewport. So I'm saying that images coming in, textures coming in are in sRGB color space. And what we're actually working with as a renderer is just linear color, so color that hasn't been corrected, the gamut hasn't been corrected, and then translate that back to sRGB so we can see it accurately on our computer monitor. So I've set that up in render settings and in the display settings for the render window. Okay, so we've now set that up. I'm just doing the IPR render, just so we can have a tweak of the materials. It doesn't always refresh, I'm just doing another click there. I'm just going to find the magic number and to sort of start to get dirty here. Beautiful. Okay, that's the spot. So, another thing to notice here is I've extruded this so it's got two faces. My default my will say that objects are double sided. My settings are set so that they're not. I can turn that on and off there in the second tab, which is in the attribute editor for an object, which has always got to do with how an object appears. So, what we want to do. What I'm going to show you is just a really quick um, um, way of just doing a work in progress render. Um, and that's going to involve just using a quick preset in uh, Mentoray for lining, which is the physical sun and sky button. Just setting the scene up first, so just moving everything that's been grouped together nicely onto the ground plane and then we'll put in a polygon plane just as a ground and make that quite generous in size. So I'm going to assign, it's usually a good idea for your ground plane to have a different material. I'm just going to give it a lamp and just make it a little bit darker, given that it's the same lamp on my, um, on the rest of our object, so it can be differentiated visually from the ground plane if we get an angle that requires that. So really what we need to do is we need to work with our cameras to get some interesting angles and lighting is going to make a difference but we're not going to spend too much on lighting, we're just looking at a quick work in progress render. So we're going to be working in a 16 by 9 frame. You can see here it's 960 by 540. And we'll turn off the grid just to remove that clutter. Just do a quick render. And things are looking fairly boring at the moment. So what we're missing is the magic ingredient of light. And light makes a huge difference on how models appear. So to scale this ground plane a little bit more and then we'll open up and have a look at some of the lights that we can just quickly use for a work in progress render. So over in the render settings, under the indirect lighting tab, there's a button for creating a physical sun and sky. What that does is it turns final gathering on. It also creates a direct light. And the direct light is also linked to a mental image's physical sky, which is plugged into your camera. And into your camera, there's also an exposure control. So we'll see this in a minute. This is what the render looks like, just clicking the button once, and you can see it. Um, you can see the sky in the background, um, and that sky will change depending on which way the directional light is tilting, as if it was a change of day. It should look something like this. So, because we're working in linear color, it's doubled up a little bit with its correction and there on the camera you can see it's also connected to the camera 
the sky and this exposure simple. So I'm just going to set the gamma back to 1 and that should fix the double correction. Now what this means is if we're going to set up a few different views, say three views, or just some still renders of this object, then we want to keep these, um, these nodes as well. I'm just going to adjust the horizon height there, just so it's below the ground plane, just by putting in minus, minus 1. And now we'll, we'll have a look at setting up some cameras. So with a couple of clicks we've got good light, we've got the sky which is giving us a fill, bounced light, we've got the sunlight um, that's linked to the sky, and we're getting a reasonably nice light setup. Just minimise these windows. Just gonna actually close this one so it doesn't keep IPR rendering. And we'll turn the lights on in the viewport and if you press Ctrl T it opens up your manipulator tool which can help you as well as rotating the directional light to sort of place it. There we go, Ctrl T which gives you a look out for your light. And what I want to try and do is get a kind of hit this on an angle so it picks up any highlights and we get shadows in it in an interesting area. So we're just using one light. It's pretty lazy, but we may as well not be too lazy and kind of hit this on a glancing angle so we get some nice shadows to pick up on some of the details. Should be a fairly quick little adjustment with the IPR render on. Occasionally you've got to drag a new rectangle in it for it to um, pick up your movement of the light, which is slightly annoying. It's usually pretty good with settings, but with lights, when they move around, it doesn't always capture them. So you can see that's starting to... You can see the sky system changing colour as the angle of the light changes. I actually hit it from the opposite side, I think. And I think that's going to give me... Fresh, and I think uh, we'll just settle on that. It's pretty good from from that side. Great. So now what we're going to do is we're going to make a few copies of that perspective camera with all those nodes connected to it. So in the window rendering editor, hypershade, we'll open up the hypershade and go to the Cameras tab and we'll graph the network, right click and graph the network of the camera. And selecting one camera, we can uh, just grab one, go to Edit, go to Duplicate with connections to network. And I'll just do that a couple times, a few more times, three more times. And so what that means is <coughs> that going to retain the physical sky set up of the environment and also the exposure control even though I've pretty much zeroed that out. I'm just going to go in and relabel these now to cam 1 and cam 2, cam 3 and then we'll set these cameras up to some interesting views to showcase our model. Just as stills in this case get to moving cameras and on. So clicking there so that we can get our resolution gate and just selecting the camera and change the lens to a shorter lens so I get more perspective convergence. And I'm thinking of picking up on some of the details on the side here and it kind of sort of the shape of this feels like a 
imposing kind of 30s, 40s structure. It's like a hotel. Something you would find in a hotel. Alright, so now we'll jump across to another camera. In a minute. Pretty happy with that, I think. some parallel lines fading off to the right corner and we should get in the foreground the nice knobs and dials it should look nice so the next camera is perspective 2 and I think we'll see if we can get another sh another angle It's really just a question of finding an interesting view. And really the view also needs to sort of, you need to sort of light for that view somewhere, which we're not doing here because we're trying to be a bit quick. Kind of like that. Again, that's kind of an imposing structure as well. I don't want to be sort of looking completely up at it, I'll just move it around a little bit. should probably try and be a little bit wide with this one. So I should probably change it to maybe a 35. Oops, that was the other camera. Don't do that. Select this camera, change that to a 35mm camera. Let's see if we can get a kind of interesting wide frame. to kind of light, I'm just turning on that grid here so I can s get the angle right. I can refer it at 22. I'm just going to rotate the camera a little bit. boring frame but at least it's aligned now. Let's pull out a little bit. Great. So we've struck three cameras and better just have a quick look at them before we commit to a render so you can just IPR render them. I've paused it so you don't have to uh, suffer them all. Let's see if the render is going to chug its way through it. You can alternatively just do, a, just, just do a, a viewport render, which is what I do in a second. There we go. So there's each one rendered, and then you can just click on the save image little button there, so you can scrub through. And that's the three shots. I think the best one is the first one. I think got a lot to do with the lighting as well, but we'll be able to adjust the exposure and stuff, so you can see how you can just adjust the, the gamma a little bit, and the exposure, so we can do that in post, don't have to worry too much about that now. It's handy having these little exposure dials in the new version of Maya. Right, so now we will 
set things up for actually doing bigger render. So open up our render settings and we're going to change the accuracy. It doesn't need to be so high for the final cut. I'm going to just drop that down by half. And the point of interpolation I'm going to put up to 20 because if there's any blotches that will help clean that up. I'm going to put the quality of 0.5 overall. And I'm going to change the filter from Goss, Gaussian to Mitchell because I do want it to be kind of quite crisp just for this whip. Then you can see in the comment tab it's already put our three cameras in. I'll just delete the perspective one. Turn the default light off. It would have been turned off when there's another light made in the scene anyway. Over to quality of the frame buffer. You can see that it's going to render it out in 16-bit color channels. Uh, which means we can adjust the exposure and gamma without too much problems in Photoshop. I'm going to change the file type to a EXR. Open EXR. I'm not going to worry about compression. Uh, it's just three, three images. And then for the name, I'm going to right click and choose scene name, insert scene name. And then after that, camera name, just to identify which shot they are. So that's handy. And then when you're ready, you can click on Batch Render. But of course, probably change your resolution. So we're in 16 by 9, it could be 1024 by 576. It could be 1280 by 720. It could be 1920 by 1080, and so on. I think I'm going to go with for me, I'm going to go with 1280 by 720, but um, there's your kind of standard TV framings I'm kind of stuck with. And when you're ready, click on Batch Render, Continue, and I'll just pause this. Alright, let's finish rendering now, and you can see I just opened up the script editor to see where the files were if you were unsure. There's my files, they've been labeled correctly drag them into Photoshop. I'm going to say that I want to interpret the transparency as an alpha channel, alpha channel, alpha channel, and then just the same as I did in Maya, I'm going to use exposure, which is an adjustment layer, just to um, brighten up two of the cameras, which was preferable. And then if we wanted to, we've got an alpha channel if we wanted to get rid of this blue sky, but it's not really bothering me at the moment. So that's three images we've got to show our work in progress of our model and sort of we're not done anything too much with the materials just so we can focus in on the model and um, you can see that's 